Good evening, this is Raven Dana with Walking Between the Worlds and thank you for tuning in this evening. This is class two of the series, Gifts Beyond Fear. So if you tuned in before, you're familiar with the subject matter and we're gonna pick it up a bit where we left off and carry the conversation a little bit more into uh, other territory. Liminal places. One of the things that we notice is that strange events occur more readily in what we call thin places or places where the reality uh, between this world and the other worlds is shifting a little more fluid. So that can happen where there's an energy vortex. It can happen where there's a magnetic flux on the planet somewhere. It can also happen at any liminal place, meaning uh, caverns, caves, seashores, crossroads, places where energies come together, where the water washes up onto the shore, uh, rivers, near rivers, that's another liminal place. Like liminal times of day also count, right? Dawn and dusk, the places between, when people are just starting to wake or everything is just slowing down, that gray time, the gloaming. So there are well-known liminal places. And you might have heard, for example, of the Bermuda Triangle. So these are places that we either avoid or hear tales of and get ourselves well and truly frightened. So I just wanna share with you something a little different today, that the liminal places also have survivors, people who have had encounters there with strange things that, that generally aren't spoken about because they came out the other side of it. So I'm gonna encourage you to Google up uh, Bermuda Triangle Pilot Survivor. And there's a wonderful little video about a guy who flew, who was flying over the Bermuda Triangle and he flew into this cloud. He at least thought it was a cloud. And then it began to swirl and grow and grow and swirl around him until he realized he was in this structure that was like a hollow tube made of cloud. And there was flashing light in there that he said was, looked nothing like lightning. Very long story short, he stayed in there and didn't try to get out of it and eventually saw that the tunnel, what, he, what felt seemed like a tunnel, opened up to blue sky. And when he popped out the other side of it, the most astonishing thing was that he had traveled an extraordinary amount of, uh, an extraordinary number of miles in a very short period of time. Now, just to double check that, they, they measured their fuel and realized that yes, in fact, something happened in that tunnel and moved them from point A to point B in a way that they did not and could not understand. So, you know, well, time fluctuation. I, I don't know if you've ever had anything like that occur, but I have. Uh, if you've had, some, not, not in the Bermuda Triangle, but what I mean is, have you ever had a period of time where time shifts or warps? And I don't mean those circumstances where you're busy and you're doing something and you don't notice the passage of time. I mean like when you get in your car and you end up someplace and you know damn straight it's not possible for you to have gotten where you were in the amount of time that has elapsed. That's the kind of thing I'm talking about. And then you talk yourself out of it, right? Or you go for a walk or you go meandering somewhere in the woods and in an hour you end up in some place that you couldn't, if you were running at top speed, you couldn't get there in an hour. So if you've ever had an experience like that, or if you've ever had a day that was like out of time, where time there was something off and something different about the way time was moving, then just know that you've been in that zone, in that twilight zone, in that between place where ordinary agreed upon reality is bending and shifting in some way. It happens all the time. If you've ever had an experience of something that has disappeared and then reappeared, and, and I don't mean something that you've lost and then found. I mean something that, uh, I, and I'll give you an example. I know somebody who um, tossed something. They were standing in front of their fireplace. And I forget now what the item was, but they tossed something up onto the mantle and saw it hit the mantle and literally vanish. 
they saw it hit the mantle, didn't bounce back at them, and it was gone. And they thought, this is crazy. And they were stand, they were, there was a family member there, and they looked, I mean, the, it was a wooden floor, there was nothing in front of it, there was no rug for it to be under, no chair for it to have bounced into. It was gone. So the item, and it was some kind of little tchotchke, it was, you know, like I said, I don't remember uh, the shape of it right now. But any, in any event, the, it, was, it was nowhere. They, they, they saw it hit the mantle and then vanish right before their eyes. Well, very long story short, they eventually gave up looking for it. And a couple of weeks later, in the medicine cabinet, of all places, they, they're standing in the bathroom in the morning jockeying for who's going to get to use it first and who's going to, and they're kind of playing around and teasing each other. And one of them opens the medicine cabinet and they both go silent because there's the thing that hit the mantle and vanished. And, and they were both, you know, each of them told me independently that they wished that the other one had actually done it and it was a joke, but neither of them did it and it was a, just a thing that happened. So, you know, things like this happen all the time. And I saw something actually wonderful happen uh, like, like that, a strange thing that happened. Um, many years ago, there was a little girl who was up in my apartment with her dad, and there were a couple of us standing around this little uh, square coffee table having a conversation. And we were all standing at different places in the room, kind of chat, adults chatting with each other. And the little girl came running and she tripped. And when she tripped, she fell. And what we all saw from completely different angles, which was the most bizarre, I could see if one of us saw this, and it was a, you know, an optical illusion from where we were standing. But she fell in such a way that it was like the corner of the table passed through her eye, but went right through her head and came out, and she came out, came out the other side. Now, she didn't get hurt, nothing happened. She fell on the floor through the table and then got up and you know cried for a second because she fell but she was fine there was no mark on her there was n nothing now I, like i said if it were one of us that saw that from one angle of the room we could write it off as an you know just a visual anomaly but that three of us saw it from three completely different locations in the room that's another conversation entirely so my you know my comment is that that little girl had somebody watching out for her in that moment. Something happened there. Um, anyway, lots of things like that occur. So the twilight, seashore, caverns, high places, uh, magnetic flux, crossroads, marshes, ancient temples, some even modern churches that are built in a certain way to uh, house and hold and contain energy. They're all vehicles for moving, moving through time and space a little bit differently, for strange and energetic events that um, are very uh, unusual. And again, this is one of the reasons why, well, when there's more negative ions in the air, and I don't mean like negative as in bad and wrong, when there is more negative ions in the air, it ramps up the activity. So by moving water, for example, by in, under the light of the full moon, during a thunderstorm. You know, why do all those spooky movies happen at night? You know, right, the sun goes down, it starts to get dark, there's a thunderstorm, and the ghosts come out, right? That's, you know, there's some truth to that, right? All right, so when we have that feeling that we're not alone, uh, I'm going to invite you to try something different. If you've ever had that feeling and ever got spooked by that feeling, try this, try, just try this as a little experiment. If you have a feeling that you're being watched by an unseen presence, what if in that moment you did this? The first thing you do was shield, right? We talked about that last time. You can say the word shield. You can imagine yourself encased in a bubble of energy that's impenetrable. You can do it any way you want to do it, right? Shield. First thing you do is so that you feel safe from whatever it is, right? But the second thing that you do is check out you, how you really feel. Is it just that you feel like you're being watched or does something feel off as in threatening to you? Because the majority of the time, just because we feel like something's there or we're being watched, we get ourselves scared. So I'm gonna invite you to see if it's possible to get past that. 
If you can check in with yourself and you might notice, oh yeah, I feel like I'm being watched, but I don't feel like I'm being threatened. I don't feel like there's something creepy bad here. I just feel like there's someone or something here. Okay, so step one is shield. Chest, ch check in is step two. And then the third step is to invite the presence to make itself known. I know, sounds crazy. But it's better than wondering. You can invite the presence to make itself known. You can see if you, you can say it out loud. You can say, I feel you. I'm interested in knowing if, you're, if, if you can make uh, contact with me. You can even say, I don't want you to touch me, but I'd like to know if you're here. Can you do something else? You might even try knocking and see if it will knock back. Hit, say, hey, can you make a sound? Look, I'm gonna knock. Can you knock back and then listen? Now, of course, if you get a knock back, you know, you might have that urge to flee. So I would encourage you again to take a breath and to let your curiosity rise and just say thank you. Now, you can also say, okay, I know you're here. I acknowledge your presence. Now I'm going to ask you to go somewhere else. You can do that. If it really, if you freak, if you freak out, you can ask it nicely to leave, right? You don't have to, you know, leave, run away. You don't have to run away. So I would say... A lot of times when we get ourselves scared, uh, we don't stop to think, am I, am I scared because I feel like there's something bad going on? Or am I just scared because there's something unusual? So the majority of the time, it's just something a little off in, in not our normal experience. And so we scare ourselves. But what if we didn't? What if we were able to get calm and curious enough to actually interact with a, a person or a being that's in the between, that's in a different space than we're in, a different um, reality than we're, than we're in. What might you encounter? What might you learn? Could be fascinating and wonderful. Could change the way you look at yourself and the world. Uh, there are lots of different possibilities. Um, thin spaces, I don't know if you've ever heard of a place called Skinwalker Ranch. But Skinwalker Ranch is well known for a whole host of anomalies, everything from UFOs to um, cryptids, you know, strange beings that show up and then disappear, um, uh, knocks, knocking sounds, uh, dreams, uh, cattle, cattle mutilations, you name it, it has happened on Skinwalker Ranch. And there's even right now, there's a television show out about Skinwalker Ranch with a team of people that are researching and all these different anomalies, even there's even um, electromagnetic phenomena and there's uh, strange radio signals that are emanated from the ranch. Now, Skinwalker Ranch, uh, that information is old. It's come to our attention in the past, however long, you know, since the first book came out, maybe 15 years ago. But that area has been known for strange occurrences for a very long time. The Native Americans who live on the Mesa tell stories about the, the star people, the, the sky people, who have been there, who, have, who go in and out of that Mesa, go in and out of the mountainside. So this is not, you know, it's not unusual in the sense that it's been happening for a long time. It's unusual in the sense that it's gotten our attention in a totally different way through books and now the media. And um, again, I'm not encouraging you to, you know, hop on a plane and go to Skinwalker Ranch. I'm just saying that this is a very famous place where uh, because of whatever's going on there in the ground, under the ground, around the area, energetically, electromagnetically, that there, uh, are, there are a number of thin spaces, thin places, where things occur. Now, a long time ago, when the Skinwalker Ranch first book came out, it was so fascinating to me because I had just had a really peculiar experience in the middle of the night. And it was only about a week or so after I had that experience that I stumbled across uh, an article. That, or, no, it was an advertisement. It was something on television about that mentioned Skinwalker Ranch that made me go look it up, that made me go find the book. And um, the thing that I had experienced was uh, in a dreamlike state, you know, how you wake up and you're kind of half in and half out in a dreamlike state. 
I woke up in the middle of the night and I was, I became very aware that there was something, there was a light in the room that I was in. And I thought I must have not turned the night light off. I must have not turned my uh, bedside lamp off, except that it was coming from uh, above. It was coming from higher up in the room. And it was not the same color. It wasn't a bright peachy light. It was a cool blue light. Uh, in any event, I experienced that light. Uh, I turned and I opened my eyes and I looked at it and it looked exactly like a window, like an open window that was hovering about five feet off the ground. And it was about, I want to say maybe three feet tall by three feet wide. Okay, a window. And like I was looking into this room, which was really odd. And I closed my eyes and I imagine, I don't know really what happened, but I imagine I fell back to sleep because my next experience is something leaning out that window and grabbing me and pulling me out of my body and into that room. And I, I had the impression even at the time that these beings were, I don't know, juvenile, that they were like children. And they were talking back and forth in clicks and sounds and these sounds and they covered me up with a blanket and they were shushing each other. They were making these sounds and they got very still and very quiet. And then another being, a large being, uh, I, am, I would imagine, came, something else walked into the room and they were very, very quiet. And um, then whenever, whatever that being was went away, they very hurriedly pulled this smelly, and it was smelly, the place was smelly, just saying, pulled this blanket off me and dumped me unceremoniously over the ledge of this window-like aperture and back into my body where I sat up and I saw whoosh, the window disappear, close. Okay, so that was the experience, and yeah, it was kind of freaky and weird, but it was also... Um, I don't know, that was kind of uh, almost amusing and entertaining, like here are these two kids that pulled this human into their house through this portal and they're going to get in trouble. It had that kind of feeling to it. Anyway, when I read some of the stuff then about Skinwalker Ranch uh, and read reports of openings that looked like windows in the sky or windows in the woods, portals where other beings could be seen through them. And even one of the ones in the sky, they saw something passing by that looked like a ship. I thought, well, isn't that interesting, right? Like not that Skinwalker Ranch is there in, you know, in my bedroom in this house I lived in, but I, I, I thought, you know, I have this experience, and then a week later, I read about experiences that are similar. Again, it's one of those coincidence uh, things that is not a, you know, a, a coincidence that is not a coincidence, right? It's a synchronicity. In any case, um, so the question still remains, so what good can come of weird and strange encounters? You know, even ones that are relatively frightening. Well, in the same way that you might think of having an experience that then you look back and say, you know, that had, that had some real value to, to it. Um, you might look at a frightening encounter and sit back and say, you know, even though at the time it was scary, I noticed this, I noticed that. Here's what I know now that I didn't know before, right? We can come away with a knowing that it's real that we're not alone in the universe. We can come away with knowledge that whatever these beings are, they they didn't hurt me. You know, they're, they're, they're beings. They, they have uh, the ability to move through time and space in a way that we don't understand. Um, it's, it's fascinating to me. We can stumble upon the truth that we ourselves are living in multiple realities and that we're just tuned in to a very small number of frequencies that allow us to navigate our, our typical three-dimensional survival mode, right? This is survival mode, right? We, we get up, we take care of ourselves, we go to work, we pay our bills, we eat our food, we go to sleep. We, you know, we're not doing the survival things that our ancestors did, where they had to build fires outside and keep somebody at the gate to keep the stuff away that was trying to eat them in the middle of the night. We don't have to spend all day as hunters and gatherers finding our food and our fuel, but we have still narrowed our capacity for more, for more three-dimensional survival mode living. And that's not all we are. 
In fact, our ancestors had better access because they were able to bring back a lot of information from their dreams and visions that helped them survive. And as we have evolved, I think in some ways we have also de-evolved because we have started to narrow those gates and to block out that information in favor of quote unquote logical, linear, rational reasoning, which is great for some things, not so great for other things, right? When we push back against quote unquote logic and there are no explanations for many of these experiences, unfortunately, our first level reaction is fear. So again, to see if we can make that little shift away from fear and into curiosity opens up our world, not just our world of the strange and unusual, but our everyday world where we will notice and feel and see wonderful things, good things that we, we would also otherwise uh, miss or ignore or uh, dismiss, okay? Um, there's a book that I'm going to recommend that you take a look at if you want to go into some experiences that people have of otherworldly beings that are not negative, because, you know, there's a lot of that out there. Uh, stories of the Blue Men that were seen by many Vietnam veterans, encounters with the Blue Men, are in a book called Space Age Indians by Artie Sixkiller Clark. And I'm going to tell you uh, uh, one or two of those stories. So this is a soldier, his name was Ira. And uh, again, these are all stories of Native Americans. So uh, there is a, a longstanding tradition in many, uh, many Native communities uh, of a conversation about having been seated, the humans, specifically Native Americans, having been seated on this planet by the star people, by the star beings, that they are our, not just our relatives, but our direct ancestors, and that they, through history, check in on us. They've never really left, and they come back to see how we're doing, and, you know, they are certainly to be uh, respected. I'll say it that way. Um, so anyway, this is th these are a couple stories uh, that occurred during the Vietnam War. So Ira's story, he is with his troop, and he is seeing the uh, Viet Cong, they're shooting at something, and they're not shooting at them, so they, they get a little closer to see what they're shooting at, or what's happening over the hill, and they see these lights in the trees, these tall blue lights moving among the VC, and they're shooting at them, and shooting, and shooting, and shooting at them, and there's not, they don't understand what they're seeing. They're just seeing these men shoot at these lights, and so they retreat, they back away, and they back away, and they back away, because they don't know what's going on. And then they see this tremendous flash of light, and then there's silence. And now they're even more confused. So they wait a, a while, and um, they're still moving away from that area. They, they, they think, well, in the morning, they're going to go take a look at that site, but they don't want any part of it at that moment. They're, they're still retreating. And then they see that those blue lights are moving towards them. And Ira, who is in the head, the, uh, head of this little uh, group of men, he encounters a blue light face to face, and it takes the form of a human-like being, a human-type uh, face and body structure. He doesn't, he can't really see the face because it's luminous, it's glowing. And he has the immediate impression that what he needs to do is put his weapon down, which he does. And he calls to his men to put their weapons down, to lower their weapons, which they do. And several more of these blue beings come out of the woods and stand among them. And he has this face-to-face this -face encounter where he has this knowing, this awareness that these beings have been around for a very, very long time, that they have evolved to the point that they used to be like us, solid beings, and that they have evolved to the point of being mostly light, which is what he sees, and that they don't like war, right? Those are the three things he comes away knowing. Uh, and they stand there face to face for, uh, he says, you know, a couple of minutes. It seems like a couple of minutes, could have been 20 seconds. And then the blue beings fade off and disappear among the trees and they're gone. And um, so, you know, they, they bed down 
And in the morning, they decide they, they are going to go take a look at that site, and they go to where the VC were shooting, and they find no people, but they find plenty of weapons, and they've, they've all been melted, warped, carbonized. Um, so it's fascinating. It's a fascinating story, all right? Okay, so the blue men, Iris said, the, like the thing that struck him the most is that, that they were once like us, solid, and became beings of light through their evolutionary history. That's something that he came away knowing. And that sentiment is repeated by other people who have had encounters with the blue men in, in Vietnam. So what can you take away from any strange encounters you have? You know, what are the gifts beyond fear for you? What scares you? Do you ever have a nightmare that scares you? Very often when we have a nightmare, we're dealing with an energy or a power that we have not fully, mm, how can I say this? That we haven't completely allowed ourselves to embrace or understand. So for example, I'm thinking of someone who had a recurring nightmare about a bear and kept waking up right, right as the bear, the mother bear reared up and opened her mouth and extended her paws with her enormous claws toward him. And then he decided that he was going to wait and see what happened. And so one time, instead of waking up, he just stood in the mouth of the cave and made himself wait, fully expecting that the bear was going to eat him, kill him, slash him, something. But the bear came forward and embraced him. And he discovered in that embrace that the bear was a tremendous healing energy and that the bear was giving him some of her own energy and some of her healing power and that he could also then have the, this, the dream of the bear and the healing nature of the bear once he embraced that within himself. So it, it's fascinating what happens when we re-enter a dream, particularly that we've had over and over again, and we wait it out, we stop and see what happens next. I know somebody else, same idea, had a dream of, she was terrified of snakes, kept having a dream of a really big snake. I mean, huge snake hanging down from a tree big enough, snake big enough to, you know, probably eat a horse. And she would see the inside of the snake's mouth when it opened its enormous mouth and it would wake her up with her heart pounding and, and all that stuff. Okay, so again, long story short, she goes back, she has the dream again, she talks herself into waiting it out. You know, maybe I can kill the snake, maybe, uh, it'll shrink and become small. Maybe, it, you know, all these, all these things she's telling herself. Well, no, the snake actually, um, she enters the mouth of the snake and goes into the dark tunnel, which is the snake. And then she becomes the snake. And she realizes that she's shedding, that she has outgrown herself, outgrown her life. And in the dream, she is the snake and she's peeling off uh, her skin. She's peeling off the old dead skin and she comes out of this water bath. She comes out of, like she said, it was like a lake, a pool. She comes out of this water bath with beautiful, silky, shimmery, shiny skin and she feels radiant and new and she wakes up and she knows exactly what she, what she was telling, like what, what it was she needed to do, what she, what she was looking to change, that it was time, that it was that she needed to shed her old skin. So she made some pretty remarkable changes in her life after that dream, all for the better, I might add. All right, so it's, uh, it's fascinating, right? Sometimes when we're in the crossroads and we have an encounter with something, some force or entity that is undefinable, you know, whether it's in a vision or, a, you know, late at night or in a dream or in a spooky house, you know, regardless of where we are, sometimes what we come away recognizing is that we too are undefinable and that our thoughts, our emotions and our actions 
ripple across multiple timelines and realities all day, every day. We too are undefinable and strange and beautiful and that everything we are and everything we do shines through the multidimensional worlds. So it isn't just that we're here in this small reality and something infringes upon our space. It's not that at all. We exist and extend through other time and space realities that we are typically unaware of, but it doesn't mean it's not happening. Just like, you know, we can't see some of the light spectrum, yet we know we get a sunburn, right? We can't hear some of the sounds that are high frequency, but we know they're there. We know our dog can hear them, right? So there are, in the same way, there are realities that we coexist with and beings that we coexist with all day, every day. And our thoughts and our emotions cross those boundaries and barriers and have some impact in those other worlds. Which again is why I encourage you when you start to get scared to take stock and take a breath, to go ahead and shield if you feel threatened, to go ahead and get yourself in your body in the moment and out of your head so that you can calm down, take a few breaths and see what's there available to you. I'm actually, I'm taking a class right now, by the way, um, a teacher training level two from Robert Moss, and it's a wonderful class. And somebody said something, made this comment in that class today, which I loved, and I'm going to pass along to you. He said that he had this realization that when he go, goes out and looks at the woods and nature and flowers and trees and beautiful things and sees the sky and feels the wind, that it's all looking back. Just as he's standing there saying, look at that, isn't that marvelous? Isn't that beautiful? That the wind is looking at him saying, isn't that marvelous? That the trees are looking at him saying, isn't that human beautiful? And so I'm gonna leave you with that thought today. I think it's, it's uh, the perfect thought to end today's session with. So thank you for spending this time with me today. I hope you enjoy the stories and that you play a little bit in that, in those energies and see what's up for you there. And we're going to do a little meditation now. I'll take you on a journey to end our class today. All right, so get yourself into a comfortable position with your back supported and bring your attention to your breath. And as you breathe, ride the flow of your breath, rising on the inhale and drifting down gently on the exhale. Close your eyes. Feel your breath flowing through your body effortlessly and relax. Floating up on your inhale, you rise. And drifting down on your exhale, you soften and relax. You feel your body settle down a little more with every out breath. Your shoulders relax. Your belly softens and your mind becomes quiet. And in that space between thoughts, images begin to rise. And you find yourself walking along a path in the woods, going up an incline, not very steep, but an incline just the same. And to the right, as you rise, you can see down across the forest floor. You can see a lake. And to your left, the trees begin to drop away and you see a rocky outcropping to your left. And as you climb, it becomes more pronounced all rock to the left of the path, trees and woods to the right. 
And then you find this space, it's a little wider on the path. And there are vines, flowering vines, hanging from the rock to your left. And you feel a breeze and recognize that the vines are covering the opening of a cave. And you pull back those vines and step inside where it's cool and shadowy. You allow your eyes to adjust to the change in the light and it's still bright enough to see in there. You can see markings on the cave walls and you reach up and touch those markings. You can feel the history of this place. You're aware that people have come into this cave for generations and generations, that they've told stories, build fires, shared dreams, had visions, that this cave is a special place. And so you take a moment and sit quietly on the floor in the dimmer light of the cave. You can see the stripes of light shining through the vines in the mouth of the cave. And you hear something, a soft noise but definitely something deeper in the darker part of the cave. And for a moment you feel afraid, but you wait, you take a breath. And you see an animal emerging from the back of the cave. And when you see its face and see its eyes, you are suddenly no longer afraid. It looks at you and you look at it. And you just feel this sense of recognition. There's nothing to be done. There's nothing that needs to be said. You just notice each other. And for a moment, the animal sits close enough that you can observe each other well. and you feel this sense of communion, contact, acceptance. And then you realize it's not an animal at all, that it's a being of some kind, a being that you've never encountered before but still, you are not afraid. And again, you sense this acknowledgement. And without a sound, the being rises and retreats back into the darkness of the cave leaving you with a feeling of wonder and awe. And you rise 
and part the curtain of vines and step out into the light, giving your eyes a moment to adjust. You look out at the forest and at the blue sky and the bright clouds and you feel so alive. And you begin walking back down the path, humming a happy little tune to yourself. Again, just reflecting on your experience, feeling that tingle, that rush of energy in your body, curiosity, a little fear, and wonder. And you find yourself all the way back down the path to the place where you started. All the way back to a small grove of trees with picnic tables and benches. And you sit. You just sit and take in the sight for a moment. The trees, the grass, you close your eyes and breathe. And slowly you begin to breathe your way right back into your body, into the moment, into the room in which you rest. Calling yourself back gently, breath by breath. Returning to the moment with a sense of wonder returning to the moment and filling your body with your own awareness. You come back all the way now and allow your eyes to open. All right. Well, thank you for the journey with me and thank you for sharing this space with me today. I hope you enter your next week with a lot more curiosity and less fear in your life in general. And please feel free to contact me with your stories, your dreams, your encounters, your questions. I'm happy to hear from you. Thank you again for tuning in with me today, Raven Dana, Walking Between the Worlds, Class 2 of the gifts beyond the fear. Have a great evening. Bye now.